Snake River salmon are on the run from the Locksaw River in the north down to the south fork of the salmon near McCall. Anglers are shouting with delight. Fish on. Don't touch my line. Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. This summer, for the first time since the mid-1960s, a majority of Idaho's traditional salmon waters were open to fishing. And what a season it has been. It's like a flashback to the Idaho of 35 years ago. Big water, big fish, and big grins. Anglers line up along the banks of the Little Salmon River every few feet, casting their lines into the turbulent stream. Well, I've just been fishing right along in here in this fast water and get right on the bottom. And I had four on here just in the last five minutes. Willis Law came all the way from Utah for a chance on an Idaho salmon, and the trip has paid off both in fun and fish. So far, he's tagged five hatchery fish and released several wild ones, and every catch has been a challenge. It feels like you got a horse trying to pull away when you're putting it in a trailer. Just really pull you hard. You gotta put your drag right to zero and just hang on for all you're worth. They get out of the hole and they're gone. You gotta hold them right there in the hole. What happened there? That's an 80 fish, wild fish. You gotta let them go. Regulations require that any fish not raised in one of Idaho's seven salmon hatcheries be released unharmed so it can swim further upstream to spawn naturally. They're all feeling real good. <laughs> they fight good. I love it. Whew. Willis is not the only one who's loving it. The salmon season has been a huge success. Anglers from as far away as California and Texas have descended on the small town of Riggins where the Little Salmon River meets the big one. And this is good news for area businesses, from motels and restaurants to tackle shops and gas stations. Fishermen always bring in a lot of business. Makes everybody in town happy. It's been the best summer they've had in years at the Riggins Motel, and in the hook, line, and sinker tackle shop, business is booming. Anytime we get this many people in town, uh, it always helps our little community here. In fact, according to an independent study conducted by Ben Johnson Associates, if Idaho salmon runs were restored, it would generate $60 million annually and directly create about 1,000 jobs in our state. It's easy to imagine this economic boom when you see the enthusiasm of the anglers fishing here today. Well, it's my first time, but I love it. I think I'm hooked. <laughs> what, have you had one on yet? I've had, I've caught two real nice ones so what far. Tell me about it. Well, the first one was about a 30-incher, and I had never caught a salmon out like this before, so it was great. It was wonderful. <laughs> Made my heart pound. And the second one was just a little bit smaller, and it was thrilling to me. Fishing lines, backlit by the sun, form a sort of cross pattern as anglers alternately cast and reel in their lures. Their faces are a study in concentration, each one eagerly anticipating that telltale tug. Jeez. When a salmon is hooked, it can be a great show, often including spectacular acrobatics performed by the fish. Other times, it's the angler who's scrambling. Watch the fellow in the white t-shirt as he tries to land his catch. It's a tug of war. Angler Andy Pearsall has the technological advantage, but the fish is using the fast moving river to aid its escape. In the end, they both win. With help from a netter below, Andy lands the fish, but it won't be held for long. This is native? Yeah. yeah. It has an adipose fin indicating a wild fish. All salmon raised in Idaho's hatcheries have one of their top fins clipped when they're still juveniles. This wild one is released back into the river, leaving behind a great memory. Someone jumping out there. Oh, that was deep. <laughs> Holy smokes. Yeah. I still had fish before, but there wasn't nothing like this. <laughs> Sometimes the stories are as big as the fish. 
Fisheries biologist Steve Pettit landed the 16 pound salmon you see him hauling out on his shoulder. Fortunately for him, fish and game photographer Rod Nichols has video to support most of his wild story. It took me out of the hole where everybody lands them and I had to climb a 70 foot cliff and couldn't even see the fish any longer and had about 200 yards of line out. And I ended up running downstream and swimming up to my neck several times for a mile. And then I finally just had to dig my heels into the gravel and say it's me or him and somehow I kept him from going up through this quarter mile long chute into downtown Riggins and landed it. Steve's fish is a repeat. That means it already swam the gauntlet of fishermen once and ended up here at the Rapid River fish trap. After frustrating attempts at jumping these man-made falls, it got shunted into the trap. Then it traveled through a series of flumes until it landed here in this tank. This year's return is so strong that the hatchery has met its quota of fish necessary for good reproduction. So these surplus salmon are marked with a punch hole in their top fin. Then they're loaded into a fish truck to be hauled back down river so anglers like Steve Pettit can have another chance at catching them. Look at this. This is what it's all about. It's nice to see smiles on everybody's faces. Little kids coming to the trap saying, I've got a fish this big. And it's, it's really good times. Yeah, great times for the fishermen, great times for the department. It's good to see these numbers again, the fish returning like they have. But the future looks grim for Idaho salmon. There's too few of the small fish called smolts migrating out to the ocean this year. In fact, experts predict that this is the lowest number in a million years. We're predicting maybe only 300 wild fish come back in 1999 off this outmigration. And so perhaps the smolts that are uh, released from this year's return uh, may provide a fishery, but I, that's probably not going to happen until 2001. But there's no guarantee those smolts will make it through the dams to the ocean and back in 2001. Angler Fred Edwards has been a reluctant witness to the demise of the salmon runs. We're wearing out together. If forced to guess, he would say he's caught around 150 salmon with his old rod, but that was back in the days when fish were plentiful and a salmon season like this was routine. It's still a thrill. You get that bite, feeling hit, and have something on there as heavy as they are, give you a, a tussle like they do. Sometimes you lose them and you sit down and you want to cry. Sometimes you catch them and you want to yell with excitement. Even at my age and as many as I've caught, it's still a thrill. This year he's had a taste of what once was, yeah, but in some hit. ways, it's only served to underscore what we've lost in Idaho. It's a shame, in my opinion, that uh, our kids and grandkids may not be able to fish for salmon and steelhead or even see them in Idaho. It, this is, in my opinion, an example of the heavy hand of man. I think nature is trying to tell us something that today it's wildlife that's disappearing. Tomorrow it may be mankind. And that really concerns me. Beginning in 1938, eight dams were built between here and the ocean, creating barriers for juvenile salmon migrating to the sea. Today, 70 to 90 percent of Idaho salmon smolts never make it. As a result, fish returns have plummeted, and in 1991, Idaho's wild salmon were listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Unless something is done soon, we'll lose our salmon and the sound of an Idaho angler shouting, fish on, will become a distant memory. Very disturbing, very disturbing. Because I think there's things could have been done and things that should have been done that would have saved the salmon and steelhead. This summer of 1997, we've had a small taste of what it was like in the old days of big water, big fish, and big grins. This is our Idaho salmon heritage. Now it's up to us to bring it back. I think we're obligated to the generations of Idaho citizens and Americans in the future to give it our best shot. I really do.
they're incredible animal. They're fascinating. They have these uh, unique uh, body adaptions too. You know, that, that tail. There's nothing else like that. An outdoorsman named Rick Birch gave us a call from southeast Idaho this summer. He said while he was scouting deer, he'd stumbled upon the largest beaver dam he'd seen in all his years of hunting and fishing. Well, that was enough for us. We decided we just had to have a look. We're sworn to secrecy as to our exact location. After all, this is Rick's favorite hunting area, and we don't want to violate that trust. Only family members Dorothy and Helen are allowed in on the secret. So let's just say it's in southeast Idaho, the heart of the old mountain man country, where at one time beaver were so abundant that the fur trappers never realized they could be over harvested. That's a busy beaver. <laughs> must have been a tall one, too. Pile of sticks up high. Rick and cameras don't get along, so we got permission to bring retired wildlife biologist Roger Williams to give us some background on this fascinating wild animal. Back in the 1950s, Roger initiated a research study in southeast Idaho on fur bears, including beaver. Really did a lot of logging to get this much old stuff in here. It's an old dam that's been abandoned. No doubt the beavers left because they literally ate themselves out of a home. They harvested all the aspens in the area, stripping the bark for food and using the wood for their huge dam. Since there are no willows growing near the pond, the beaver's other main source of food, they must have moved on. But we find the remains of one of its last occupants. Roger speculates that it may have been an old bachelor male that remained here alone. That's, yeah, that's the lower jaw. Further exploration reveals that they built a series of smaller dams above this one. Clumsy on land, the pond serves as their escape from predators such as coyotes wolves or bobcats. They've got especially large lungs and uh, an enlarged liver, which carries more oxygenated blood and the lungs more air. They can stay down, uh, I've heard, three, four minutes, in some cases even longer. They also have special valves that seal their nostrils and ears and an adaption that enables them to close their lips behind their large incisors, allowing them to chew underwater. Their lodges are in enclosed living spaces above the water that can only be reached by an underwater entrance. Here, the young are born in early summer. They're fascinating. They have these uh, unique uh, body adaptions, too. You know, that, that tail, there's nothing else like that. And there are uh, those huge teeth that they can cut down a tree up to a couple feet in diameter and peel off all the bark. A typical litter is three to four offspring. Both parents help to care for the young, but by the time they're two years old, they'll strike out on their own. So the average beaver colony includes the two adults, young of the year, and the yearlings, about eight to 10 animals. And lots of beaver peeled sticks, and all the dams are tight and holding water. About a quarter mile downstream from the big abandoned dam is another series of beaver ponds. But these the seem the to be active. And this one here probably is a home dam because it looks like there's uh, bank dens with sticks piled over the opening on the far side. And there's all kinds of fresh sign there. And you can see that the, where they've cut and peeled the bark, it's nice and bright, as opposed to those old dead ones that we looked at upstream. From this vantage point, it's also clearly evident how dramatically a beaver colony can change the surrounding area. I tell you, the beaver is an incredible animal. There, there's none other that I can think of that could come into an area and, and totally change the uh, environment from a dribbling little creek like that to a whole series of ponds. This strange creature with its thick fur also had the power to lure the mountain man to the west in the early 1800s. The height of men's fashion at the time was a felt hat made from the beaver's heavy coat. Chances are we're tracing the footsteps of the old fur trappers right here. I would, I would, I would bet large and give odds that Jim Bridger and Peter Skeen Ogden and, and two or three of those other guys actually walked up and down same places where I've been taking pictures of beaver ponds for 40 years. Not only do we have uh, the fishing game, 
the University of Idaho, but also private sector, private industry. First rule is nobody gets hurt. No heroics required. Over the years, we've brought you several stories involving the Wildlife Health Laboratory near Caldwell. Breakfast! Most recently, a safety study on a brucellosis vaccine involving bison shipped here from Yellowstone National Park. But the Wildlife Health Lab is not just a place for the study of wild animals. It's a unique facility that stands out as an example of a wildlife agency and a university working hand in hand with the agricultural community. It seems to be uh, an example of what we want to uh, see across the country working in close cooperation. And so not only do we have uh, the Fish and Game, the University of Idaho, but also private sector, private industry, uh, livestock producers, uh, game farm uh, owners working in cooperation. Veterinarian Jerry Zog sees the Wildlife Health Lab and its sister facility, the Kane Veterinary Teaching Center, as a vital link in building a bridge between traditional rivals. Often, diseases that affect wild animals may also affect domestic livestock and vice versa. You may recall in December of 1995, several bighorn sheep were discovered dead near Hell's Canyon. More were observed weak and coughing, signs of a deadly pneumonia. With funding donated from a sportsman's group called the Foundation for North American Wild Sheep, a massive rescue operation was launched. 72 of the animals were eventually brought here to the Wildlife Health Lab. Most of them succumbed to the disease, a type of bacteria called Pasteurella. But those that survived are still contributing vital data to scientists. One study is researching the ways an infected ewe may pass on immunities to her so, newborn um, lamb um, through her milk or colostrum. Isolate, it looks like we've got quite a variety of uh, biochemical reactions. If the ewe has been infected, she's going to be building antibodies against the organisms that she carries. And if that is successfully transferred in the colostrum, there should be a time of protection for the lambs from the antibodies that they get in the colostrum. Microbiologist Al Ward goes on to explain that much depends on the virulence of the particular bacteria. That too is being studied. In other research, Scientists are looking at the DNA of the wild sheep. Do these surviving bighorns carry a genetic resistance to some forms of bacteria? Uh, basically what I've done is uh, amplified a certain region of the leukotoxin A gene in Pastorella hemolytica. But the whole effort here is to learn more about these diseases and thus determine how to manage our public and private lands for the coexistence of wild and domestic sheep. Sometimes this disease work can be pretty frustrating because it seems very slow. And the answers come pretty slow. But I think uh, on the pastorella question, we've, we've come a long way. Veterinarian Marie Bulgan says that domestic sheep owners are interested in doing whatever they can do to help preserve bighorn sheep, but they also need to protect their own livelihood. So cooperating on studies like this serves everyone. Uh, one of the diseases that I worked on personally was the ovine progressive pneumonia, OPP, to see if it was uh, transmissible from domestics to bighorns. But it's not just bighorns and bison that are being studied here at the Wildlife Health Lab. These elk were captured in 1992 at the Idaho National Engineering Laboratory, or INEL site, in an operation designed to remove a surplus of wild elk from the area. Like most of the animals here, they were originally destined for slaughter. Right now, they're under two different projects. One, we're trying to find out if uh, it's possible for elk to be infected with a lungworm that affects cattle. Dictyocallus viviparus. The other project involves a test for tuberculosis. It's required for certain species of wildlife that are being transported over state or international borders. The present test requires the animals to be handled twice, once to administer the test, and then 72 hours later to check the results. 
You can see by the reaction of these wild caribou, it's very stressful for the animal and can be dangerous for the handlers. And so the idea occurred to us that perhaps it might work to uh, do this the same way that they do with primates, where they inject the, in, the uh, tuberculin in the upper eyelid. And if there is a positive reaction, this swells up and you can see it even at a distance. Consequently, the animals would only need to be handled once. These and other experiments are just a few examples of the spirit of cooperation being fostered here. And that can only serve to benefit both wildlife and domestic livestock. We close our show tonight with a creature feature, profiling Idaho's threatened fish, the Chinook salmon. Adult wild salmon return to Idaho's rivers in late summer to build nests in the stream bottom and lay their eggs. The next spring, tiny fish emerge from their gravel nests and here in these beautiful pristine streams, the young salmon offspring spend their first year of life. Then the journey begins, 900 miles to the sea. Those few that survive the journey past the eight dams spend a year or two in the ocean. Then, as adults, they return to Idaho's rivers and spawn, and the cycle begins again. <laughs>